right, good evening. Thank you for watching this virtual lecture event. For those of you who are new, IWP is a graduate school of national security and international affairs. We have five master's degree programs, 18 certificates of study, and a new doctoral program. If you're interested in learning more about us, please visit iwp.edu. This evening's event is a part of the IWP's Winning Without War series. I will begin the lecture by introducing our panelists. Dr. Frank Marlow is Dean of Academics at the Institute of World Politics. He formerly served as a Professor of Strategic Studies at the Marine Corps Command and Staff College. He received his PhD from the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy in May 2006. From January 2002 until January 2005, he served as Assistant for Counterproliferation Policy in the Office of the Assistant Secretary of Defense for International Security Policy. He's the author of Planning Reagan's War, Conservative, Conservative Strategists, and America's Cold War Victory. Ambassador Philip Hughes served as the United States Ambassador to Barbados in the Eastern Caribbean from November 1990 until July 1993. Prior to this ambassadorial appointment, he served as Executive Secretary of the National Security Council during 1989 and 1990. Ambassador Hughes is currently Senior Director of the White House Writers Group in Washington, DC. Dr. Caitlin Schindler is a research professor at the Institute of World Politics and adjunct professor at Patrick Henry College. In addition to teaching, Dr. Schindler works for a US defense contractor providing subject matter expertise, research, and analysis to various government customers, operations, and programs. Dr. Schindler obtained a Master of Arts in Strategic Intelligence from the Institute of World Politics in 2010 and completed her PhD on the historical origins of US public diplomacy at the University of Leeds. Dr. Schindler authored The Origins of Public Diplomacy in US Statecraft, Uncovering a Forgotten Tradition. Dr. Schindler's current research is focused on the origins and evolution of Russian political warfare. I would like to thank all the panelists for joining us this evening. And without further ado, I will hand it over to Dr. Marlowe. Thank, thank you. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here tonight. We're very excited to be able to, to give this uh, discussion with, with you all. Um, before I start talking about, before I start telling you what I'm gonna argue, I think I'm gonna tell you what I'm not going to argue. Um, I, when I talk, when we're talking about the importance of alliances and partnerships, I'm not saying that they are a substitute for other forms of power. They're not. Um, it's that they reinforce and they're reinforced by other types of power. So no one is arguing that alliances and partnerships can do it alone. They can't. And everyone understands that. Um, I'm also not saying that alliances and partnerships eliminate tension or disagreement with our allies. Um, anyone who understands the history, for example, of the NATO alliance knows just how difficult uh, maintaining that alliance can be. Uh, alliance management is arguably one of the most difficult tasks of statecraft. And so it, no one is claiming that this is a simple thing or that we all walk away happy. I'm also finally not saying that par partnerships and alliances are the pathway to some utopian, one world, Woodstock-esque kind of uh, kumbaya world. That's not what we're talking about. The, the value of, of partnerships and alliances fundamentally is about, it's about reducing the uncertainty about who your ad, real adversaries are. Okay, so that's, that's all the things I'm not gonna argue. So let me mention, talk about what I am, you know, why I do think alliances and partnerships are important, why they matter. First off, I want to introduce an idea that comes out of economics, and that's the idea of comparative advantage. Okay? In economics, we understand that every nation, at least in classical economics, each nation has something that they're good at, something that they have a comparative advantage over their trading partners. In other words, some things are much easier for us to do than for others and vice versa. Um, so to take the United States as an example, we are the world's premier provider of security, okay? The US security guarantee is vastly more valuable than anybody else's. We know how to do military security. We know how to provide the, the type of security that many of our partners are looking for. We're more reliable and we're better at it than anybody else on the planet, okay? That said, on the flip side, we don't necessarily have 
the best local knowledge or regional credibility. Think about our efforts to, uh, to dissuade radicalization, radical Islam, okay? We, don't, we can't talk to the Muslim world about interpretations of Islam. We don't have that qualification. We don't have that local knowledge. We don't have that credibility, okay? We don't understand the delicate relationships between ethnic groups in Southeast Asia or Sub-Saharan Africa. That's not something we have the resident knowledge of. We don't have that, that mindset, that capability. Others do. So when we can partner, when we can take our, what we're good at, things like security, things like economic assistance, and combine those with the local knowledge and the local background and the local credibility that our, our friends and partners have, that's something that we can both walk away from feeling like we're benefiting. Right? When everybody can bring something of value to the table, everybody benefits. Everybody feels like they're part of something bigger, and that's, that's, that buy-in is critical. Um, so that's the first reason, is this idea of, of comparative advantage. Um, I'll suggest an even, uh, even more simple reason. It's becoming a political necessity. Um, Americans, <laughs> we're strange, uh, strange people. Um, we find dealing with our allies extraordinarily frustrating. Um, looking, thinking back at my days in the Pentagon, um, like I say, if you haven't, you've never suffered until you've sat through a NATO committee meeting, okay? They are the most tedious, boring, painful things on the planet, truly. I, I, I still have flashbacks to some of those days because they were terrible, okay? we frequently question the values of our allies. Okay, so we have this, on one hand, we, we're sick of them, we're tired of them, we're tired of having to deal with them. On the flip side, if you ask most Americans, should we be getting involved in this conflict or that conflict? The first thing they're gonna say is we need to be doing this with allies, All right? So we have this very strange mindset in, in our country about the, relative value of allies. We don't really like dealing with them, but we also feel like we got to have them. Um, this, and certainly the, the experiences in, in the Iraq war um, made the notion of going it alone or uh, so forth much harder for any, any political party or any political leader to undertake. Um, you certainly see this on the, on the Democratic side where there's, it's almost unquestioned value uh, in these alliances. Um, very few, you're not going to find any, many or any Democrats who really push the idea that alliances are not necessarily worthwhile. Um, there's also, I would say, every indication that the Republican Party in the, the post-Trump era, whether that's in a matter of a few weeks or whether that's four years from now, um, it, it seems to me pretty clear just based on my read of, of where the major policy makers and thinkers are on this, that you're going to see something returning to a more traditionally Republican view of, of alliances, which is less supportive than Democrats, perhaps, or more cautious about them than the Democrats, but not uh, quite as uh, uncomfortable with it as the current administration. So, there, but in any event, we are moving a direction where the American public is expecting us to rely on and make use of these partnerships. Um, the third reason I think is there's a value in predictability. Um, there's an old saying, familiarity breeds contempt. And that's certainly true. Again, to go back to those NATO meetings. On the flip side, um, there's another saying that you don't wanna start exchanging business cards in the middle of a crisis, right? The, when, when something really bad is happening, that's the last time we want to start developing the partnerships and the relationships. You want those partnerships and relationships to exist and be longstanding. The frequent interactions that you have during peacetime help create the, that, that partnership, that sense of shared, shared interests that is necessary when the bullets start to fly. Okay, So it's purely in the fact that you don't want to be doing this on the fly alliances have, have value. I'd also say that they have another 
another benefit for in terms of predictability. When you're spending a lot of time with your allies, you're going to get a better idea. It'll give you a little bit of an early warning um, if something is changing within that ally. Uh, you, if they're starting to become disillusioned with your relationship, if they're starting to look like they're intrigued in, in flipping to the other side, so to speak. Um, only by having those partnerships and those relationships are you going to get that kind of knowledge, that kind of early indication that there might be something wrong. Um, it, in other words, it keeps you from undergoing strategic surprise. It prevents you from, from being blindsided by someone you thought was an ally and turns out not to be. Okay. Fourth and final uh, reason I think allies and partnerships are important, um, and it's probably the most important reason. Um, they are, without a doubt, one of the key pillars of the current existing international order. Um, much of the world accepts this current order, um, this rules-based, largely free trading, open market kind of system. They accept it not because they love everything about it. Um, you can find opponents to globalization in every country on the planet, including our own. Um, they, they accept it because they feel like they're being given a fair hearing from the US and our major allies. They feel like they may not get everything they want and they know they're not gonna get everything they want, but they feel like somebody is actually gonna to listen to their concerns and, and take them into consideration, okay? If the current international order is under attack because of, in part because of the false promises, um, then to, that are being made to our allies, they're gonna to have to be defended by more than just the United States. As powerful as the United States is, we cannot preserve the existing system purely on our own power, or even that of the United States and its European and Asian allies. It's going to require the addition of some of those developing world countries that are seeing that ultimately, the system that's being proposed by our adversaries, folks like the Russians and the Chinese, is much, much worse for them than the system that they're living under now, okay? And so in the very fact, I would point out that the Chinese and the Russians are trying to exploit the weak links in our alliance system shows that they understand that chipping away at our allies will ultimately do more to weaken our power than any of the defense buildups that they're under engaging in. That's worrisome. Their attack on our allies and our partnerships is much more worrisome, and I don't think we're paying enough attention to that. So that's why I think um, alliances and partnerships matter. And I think now I'm gonna hand it over to Dr. Schindler, who will uh, take the next step. Thanks. Uh, yes, uh, Dr. Marlowe really hit on some things that I'm hoping to kind of illustrate with going back in time a little bit, looking at the origins of the, or the predecessor organizations to the organization of American states. Um, as Dr. Marlowe highlighted, when we think about alliances, we have to think about alliances which involve the military and by extension force or the use of force. However, not all alliances um, are about force. And um, I wanna kind of go over the early history um, of the Organization of American States and the ideas which shaped that organization as it stands today to offer an alternative perspective um, to the common ideas of alliances. Simone Bolivar actually first proposed the idea of uh, Pan-Americanism in 1824, pushing for some sort of regional collective security um, arrangement among the republics to fend off European intervention in uh, the Americas. And throughout the 19th century, there were repeated attempts by different American states to um, try to create some sort of Pan-American body. This was all underpinned by this idea of collective security. However, the real first successful attempt actually came um, under President Benjamin Harrison and Secretary of State James G. Blaine in 1889. And what set this uh, effort apart from previous efforts was the attitude of President Harrison and Secretary Blaine towards the American republics um, and their desire for real cooperative uh, relations based on mutual respect. 
Um, and this, uh, particularly Secretary Blaine, was concerned about the uh, what were repeated and often problematic um, border wars that continued to persist among the Latin American states. And this was um, problematic for the United States for a number of reasons. Uh, over the years, we had initiated a lot of trade relations with Latin American nations, uh, in addition to our concerns about uh, European uh, recolonization or domination of those republics that had recently gained their independence. So from not only from a regional security standpoint, but also from a trade and investment standpoint, it was a it was a persistent problem that Secretary Blaine was often called upon to deal with. And from his perspective, the solution to this was to organize some sort of regional arbitration or mediation framework, which had kind of come into vogue at the end of the 19th century. The first Inter-American Conference was held in Washington, DC at the end of 1889 and ran through 19, uh, 1890. The representatives of different American republics broke into 15 committees to discuss a range of regional concerns from interstate travel, customs regulations, trade barriers, in addition to arbitration or uh, mediation of interstate conflicts. While many kind of debated the success of that first uh, conference, the seeds of success in terms of mutual benefits to the American public, republics and US relations with Latin America were certainly planted, at least to my mind. And the reason why this is, is going back to what Dr. Marlowe said about alliances don't necessarily mean that tensions go away. Uh, if you look at America's relationship with Latin America, there were missteps. There were um, you know, certainly heightened tensions despite what happened with the first uh, Inter-American Conference. We did things that did not go down well with our partners in Latin America. But despite all of these kind of um, fractious re uh, relationships, successive conferences were held. And part of this is because there was buy-in and recognition by those other republics to include the United States, that regardless of whatever political issues were going on, it was to everyone's mutual benefit to make this work uh, and to work through those issues that continue to plague the, the regional relations as well as regional security and trade. Um, so successive conferences were held uh, and various rev, rev, uh, resolutions were, were put forward. After that first conference, you had the establishment of the Inter-American Commercial Bureau, which published a monthly publication uh, um, that collected and shared economic investment and trade information. And this helped to build on successive conferences where they talked about um, exchanging engineers for like railroad engineering, uh, port engineering, uh, roadways, how best to um, build roads and solve things like land erosion, as well as how to maintain public health with port cleanup. Uh, a lot of the uh, South American and even American ports suffered from uh, outbreaks of cholera, yellow fever, so a lot of the American republics worked together to share information and best practices with one another. And it didn't just end with economic benefits and political um, kind of discussions. It also included intellectual and cultural exchange as well. And all of this, again, going back to something Dr. Marlowe said about you know, reducing uncertainty and the idea of not exchanging business cards in the middle of a crisis. Not too long after the establishment of the Inter-American Conference system, you have World War I, um, which became kind of a big issue with Latin American countries, in part, again, going back to American trade in Latin America, and Germany and other European nations trying to infiltrate that market. And then when the war ended, all of those European economies essentially were decimated and it had an effect on Latin American nations. 
Um, and this became a concern as uh, Europe became to kind of grow tense again in the prelude to World War II. And it was those same relationships that the United States and other Latin American nations relied upon in those moments of crises to kind of stave off the repercussions that an international conflict would no doubt bring about. So I think all of this kind of speaks to how alliances aren't just about the use of force, it's about sharing mutual needs and benefits uh, um, amongst the participants. Um, and this eventually led to what we now know today as the Organization of American States. And I'm going to echo what Dr. Marlowe said in that I feel again that we've kind of neglected those partnerships and alliances that we've spent over uh, almost a century building up. Um, and I think it's to our detriment to ignore those kinds of alliances. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Ambassador Hughes. You're on mute, Ambassador Hughes. It's a um, privilege and a pleasure to be here with Dr. Marlowe and Dr. Schindler uh, to talk uh, about building alliances and partnerships. Um, my presentation tonight in kind of the third uh, position or cleanup hitter role, I guess you might say, um, it intends to make five points about uh, alliances. Uh, and the five points all revolve around a basic idea. And the basic idea is this. Alliances are bedrock of our current national security policy and are an invaluable tool in any nation's uh, diplomacy and national security policy when used rightly and appropriately. Uh, but when misused or abused or uh, used wrongly, uh, counted on wrongly, uh, they can produce actually very counterproductive or dangerous results. You can delude yourself, in other words, uh, through the misuse of your alliances. So alliances are a bedrock of US national security policy and they have been for three quarters of a century. But remember that post-Cold War world that impelled the reversal of roughly a century and a half of a US foreign policy tradition of avoiding entangling alliances as counseled by uh, Washington's farewell address, well, that post-Cold War world um, uh, showed us that uh, we couldn't exist in isolation and needed to ally ourselves with other nations if we intended to defend freedom against a global uh, totalitarian threat from the communist world, particularly from Soviet Russia. But post-war US alliances have been different from the norm of international relations going back to the Treaty of Westphalia. Our post-war alliances have had several characteristics. They've been mostly fixed. They have been permanent. They have expanded. And really, they've only been canceled or terminated when some friendly or allied nation uh, has gone over to the other side or postured itself as a U.S. enemy through revolution or coup d'etat or adverse domestic political turn of events, the rise of some megalomaniacal or uh, uh, adversarial strongman, for example. Uh, NATO expansion in the 1990s and the early 2000s kind of illustrates the dilemma that comes with these fixed, permanent, expanding alliances that, uh, that were the child of the Cold War. Um, had we failed to incorporate the former Soviet satellites of Central Europe and eventually the Baltic states into NATO's alliance, they would have been, that would have been a formula for permanent insecurity and instability in these states, and a permanent temptation for Russian mischief, meddling, and revanchism. But of course, at the time that the alliance was being expanded, the NATO alliance, 
uh, there were voices arguing against expansion for fear that it would provoke or um, alienate Russia. Hence, we tried to walk a line of endeavoring to open NATO to Russia and uh, build confidence with Russia about NATO and NATO expansion, even while the alliance was expanding. Um, uh, that policy of NATO expansion works fine when, NATO, when Russia was a democratizing, inward focus pre uh, and preoccupied with domestic concerns and therefore not aggressive. Uh, but we're now learning that it involves dangers and risks uh, 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 that that alliance insurance policy uh, could be presented for collection uh, uh, in the face of an aggressive, interfering, intimidating, revanchist, dictatorial or pseudo-democratic Russia, uh, especially one that's determined to exploit the gray areas of international relations and law uh, through, for example, cyber hacking or uh, operations involving un supposedly unattributable little green men. Uh, the result has been, of course, that as a practical matter, we've had to put the brakes on NATO expansion to Ukraine, Armenia, and uh, of any other Soviet republics, uh, former Soviet republics, in what Russia, to my mind, arrogantly, considers its near abroad. So that leads me to the first of the big points that I'd like to make about alliances. Alliances contribute to and reinforce security when the obligations are reasonably or proportionately reciprocal and when they can be practically, that is to say also geographically, fulfilled at sustainable costs over a reasonably sustained period. Central problem, of course, of the last minute security guarantees of the Western Allies to Poland in the face of Nazi aggression in 1939 was that the Western Allies couldn't reach Poland and couldn't really come to her defense. And the only thing they could do was open a second front to a war, or they, a front they didn't really open, didn't actively fight on until they were overcome by a, the Nazi offensive. Um, that's the, the little proposition I just offered you, is why the Berlin Airlift and the Gulf War I coalition worked. But it's easy to see circumstances in which a determined opponent that enjoys the advantages of interior lines of communication could break an opposing alliance that was predicated on unrealistic or unfulfillable commitments. That leads to the second point I want to make about alliances. That on the whole, however, having an extensive network, in our case of mostly rich, economically and technologically sophisticated, legitimate democratic allies is infinitely preferable to the alternative. Sometimes it seems in our world like the for, what I think of as the forces of darkness anyway, in the international system, uh, Russia, North Korea, Iran, Syria, Cuba, Venezuela, and even for some purposes, China, enjoy the upper hand with their persistence, their durability, um, the terrorism and assassinations and political meddling and menacing intimidation of their neighbors. Uh, uh, that they they sometimes exhibit. Um, you know, who would want to trade places with them, though, when you think about their condition? I mean, look at how isolated they are, how friendless in the international system. I mean, they're sort of malefactors who are more or less friends with each other, but really kind of hard to stomach as associates if we're authentically free uh, and interested in staying free nations. Uh, look at how artificial and contrived are Russia's and China's various schemes to draw their near abroad neighbors into tighter collaboration. How self-defeating these bad actors' reliance on terrorism or violence or assassination or blackmail turn out to be. Uh, we may sometimes we think that we in the West have problems with free riding or unsteerable or fair weather friend or defecting 
allies, you know, like the French or sometimes the Germans or lately the Turks. But consider the alternative. How bleak and limited the possibilities must seem viewed from the Kremlin or Tehran or Pyongyang or, for that matter, from Zhongnanhai in Beijing in comparison to the U.S. and the Western network of alliances and partnerships. Consider how quickly the self-interested mercantilism of China's One Belt, One Road initiative became glaringly apparent to its supposed beneficiaries uh, and began to blunt its appeal even before the entire world became infected with the Chinese origin viral infectious disease, or COVID-19 for short, in 2019 and 2020. So on the whole, it's better to have allies than not, and certainly better than being a friendless malefactor in international affairs. Third, it may be that the circumstances of the post-Cold War 21st century require the U.S. to think differently about alliances. In offering this idea, I don't necessarily mean, I don't mean, in fact, to abandon or degrade U.S. reliance on our traditional long-term security partners, NATO, ANZUS, the U.S.-Australia-New Zealand alliance, the U.S.-Japan, the U.S. Uh, Republic of Korea security treaties, but rather to supplement these with added flexibility using more traditional, fluid forms of alliance without entailing indefinite, permanent commitments. After all, traditionally in international affairs, alliances were temporary. They were for very specific purposes. Usually they delimited the conditions under which the alliance would operate or not operate. And they had a time horizon to them that might be definite in the treaty, 20 years, or it might be indefinite circumstances remaining the way they are. Um, uh, that, that's not true of NATO or our other traditional U.S. security alliances. They are permanent fixtures of the international landscape and of our security policy, uh, but maybe in the more fluid world of the mid 21st century ahead, reversion to more traditional forms of temporary specific goal and conditions oriented alliances would be a constructive addition to our diplomatic repertory. Uh, maybe that would be preferable to what it seemed to me had become prior to 2016 a sort of blithe, reflexive answer to uh, threats that uh, were potentially posed, for example, to Saudi Arabia and other Persian Gulf states by the possibility or eventuality of Iran acquiring nuclear weapons. Prior to 2016, there were <clears throat> statesmen in the United States who suggested that, well, we'll just extend nuclear deterrence to those countries too as if our nuclear deterrent, already greatly reduced by uh, arms control agreements over decades, wasn't already stretched pretty thin as it was. Uh, that kind of blithe answer seems to me pretty inadequate. Um, coalitions of the willing, a term pioneered by the George W. Uh, Bush administration for Operation Iraqi Freedom, may also be a useful adjunct to our diplomatic repertory uh, for the future. Fourth point, employing more flexible partnership constructs short of formal alliances could be a useful precedent to retrieve from our past diplomatic repertory. For example, uh, to draw from the experience of the Reagan administration, which I was privileged to participate, uh, the construct of the Caribbean Basin that was employed by that administration is a useful example. It was a quite artificial construct. The nations of Central America to the West, Spanish speaking, except for Belize, um, uh, and with deeply different political cultures, were totally different to the island Caribbean um, in the East, mostly English speaking colonies, uh, the larger island nations being Spanish speaking or French, but only the Dominican Republic being kind of culturally similar, maybe Cuba, but communist dominated and outside of the Caribbean Basin Initiative because of that, 
only the Dominican Republic was similar to Central America. But by linking together conceptually these two different rims of an area of geography, uh, we helped legitimize the central thrust of Reagan administration and controversial policy in Central America, which was to uphold and actually broaden uh, democratic legitimacy and freedom among a series of small countries that were threatened by communist, uh, 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 well, domination really through uh, civil war and, and, and in interference. Um, uh, that construct then took on other elements besides mere military support. There were economic dimensions, there were judicial, judicial security and, and uh, rule of law dimensions, human rights dimensions, and other such things where one side of the Caribbean's, the Eastern side's good practices or best practices were kind of a model and uh, also a sort of conceptual political anchor for what we were trying to achieve on the Western side of the Caribbean. A similar, but not officially announced or named grouping may be emerging from the Trump administration's diplomacy to contain Iran and normalize cooperation between Persian Gulf Arab states and Israel right now. Common goals and mutual interests and benefits, uh, but not necessarily full-scale security commitments distinguish these informal cons uh, con cooperative constructs or groupings. Um, and an additional dimension of the picture, certainly from the Caribbean Basin Initiative, is that Congress uh, can then set perhaps requirements for countries to participate in particularly aspects of such a construct in which they, they qualify to, to join and to benefit. The fifth point I want to make, and it's the last major point, is that if you're a great power and you imagine that alliances and partnerships are going to enable you to ease your security burdens by laying them off on your allies, you are probably barking up the wrong tree. At least one recent article uh, by actually a veteran of uh, previous national security councils uh, that extolled the Trump administration's Persian Gulf diplomacy as erecting a series of quasi-alliance bulwarks against uh, Iranian and other malefactors that would otherwise uh, 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 operate in the Persian Gulf region, suggested that these alliances would underwrite President Trump's inclination to wind down what he calls the endless wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. My judgment, this is pro the judgment, the, the hope, the uh, uh, point of that article is probably a fatuous hope. Smaller, weaker nations join more powerful nations and alliances not to bear those larger nations' security obligations as mercenaries or surrogates, uh, as if they were adequate to that task anyway. They join to ensure their own security. Alliances, consequently, are a good way to share and spread security burdens and costs. They're a terrible way for an alliance leader or linchpin in an alliance to scrimp on their own security commitments. Doing that is a great way for a great power to get its security delusions exploded. And that's my last word on this topic. Hopefully, we'll have a lively discussion afterwards. Thanks very much for having me. Great. Well, uh, with that, um, I'm going to play the uh, moderator role. If you have questions, please do put them into the Q&A uh, button at the bottom of your screen. And I will go ahead and start, uh, start asking. OK, so uh, first question here. What do you foresee for the prospects? What do you foresee as the prospects for greater cooperation between the U.S. intelligence community and the intelligence agencies of the Indo-Pacific allies, such as India, Japan, and South Korea, against Chinese espionage efforts? 
uh, who wants to, who wants to take well, the, uh, uh, see, I, I asked the question. You got to answer. No, uh, oh, oh. <laughs> uh, if you want to take a stab at it, I can. I can certainly pipe in. Let, or let, let me take. Let me take my first stab at it. It's been decades since I actually worked in the intelligence community, and that only briefly in my other roles in government. I was uh, either a consumer of uh, intelligence or a, a, a player on the margins of the community, uh, and a lot has happened since I left government. Obviously. Um, but my my inclination would be to say that um, uh, in terms of liaison relations with uh, intelligence services around the Indo-Pacific uh, basin, uh, we we face uh, there are some opportunities, obviously, but there are also limitations and risks. Uh, most of the services we would be talking about um, are relatively small. They may have particular niche uh, access or entree, uh, but they also face challenges, both technological and personnel, of penetration and insecurity. So I would imagine, as a general rule, that those responsible for managing liaison relations with those services, whether the management come from Langley and human intelligence or from NSA or other agencies with a more technological bent, that they would be specialized, compartmented, targeted, and alive to the potential of, uh, of our collaborators on the other side being, even against their will, double. Senator, do you wanna add anything to that or? Um, I, I think I would um, echo Ambassador Hughes' remarks about the concerns related to the, the relative size of a lot of those Intel services, as well as um, concerns about possible penetrations. Um, I think in addition to buttressing those uh, Intel liaison relationships, um, you know, to kind of add on to kind of collectively what we've talked about here is it can't be single threaded um, and moving into that future perspective. So you can't just rely on force. You can't just re rely on Intel. I think in addition to those Intel relationships, there needs to be a reliance or a discussion or a forging of um, mutuality in terms of uh, diplom diplomatic relationships with those countries. And I think there has been some, some uh, movement in that direction, especially in recent years, especially regarding the South China Sea claims that China has taken to the UN and other places to contest. And some of those uh, 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 states have actually um, non-traditional American partners like Vietnam and the Philippines have actually expressed an interest in collaborating or working with the United States on a diplomatic level to counter um, Chinese attempts to claim uh, um, geographic uh, sovereignty over um, seaways in their area. So I think, you know, from my perspective, yes, 100% agree with uh, Ambassador Hughes, but again, would iterate that it's, it, especially when addressing the issues we're facing with China, it can't be single threaded. It can't just be DOD or Intel, you know, State Department needs to be in the mix along with other elements of US government. Yeah, I, I would just add to that. Um, I, I agree, I mean, I think it's nice being third because I get to agree with the <laughs> two smarter people. Uh, I, I think it's great. I think the one interesting thing I would add to that, though, is um, one of the nice things about intelligence cooperation and coordination is that it can be done out of the public view. It can be done in a way that is not notable by the publics, and, but it can start creating that mindset of trust and coordination and cooperation that can then spill over into the, the areas that, that Dr. Schindler is talking about. And so... I think that you know, as as you know, as Ambassador Hughes pointed out, the when the veil starts coming off of Chinese behavior, and that's not just intelligence behavior, but but overall behavior, 
we're finding a lot more folks want to have a lot more to do with us than they did, say, 10 years ago. Um, 10 years ago, we were talking about how everyone's kind of hedging their bets. A lot less talk of that now because the, the secret is out. And so I think um, as China becomes more aggressive, I think you're going to see more and more of these kinds of relationships coming out into the open where they were kindly kept quiet before. Um, if I may, I don't want to, to beat this horse to death, but let me just add, supplement the, the all three of our remarks with a couple of observations uh, that may illustrate what I was getting at about limits here. Um, China has a little, very long standing and intimate relationship, so does North Korea, with Pakistan and Pakistan's ISI. If you wanted to get a good surrogate window, perhaps into China through a different angle, uh, you could maybe think of a few better ways than to get deeply into bed with the ISI. But who in their right mind would get deeply into bed with the ISI after our experience with Osama bin Laden and Abbottabad? I mean, that would be insane. Um, so um, sometimes the, you know, the, the, the straightest route to Rome doesn't necessarily lead to the destination you intend at all. Secondly, look at the Philippines and the arrival of a populist leader like Duterte. I mean, we've basically counted on the Philippines as a friendly country since we liberated it from Spain in the Spanish-American War and then tutored it into independence and democracy, or, well, halting democracy, after World War II. Um, but, or during, before and after World War II, but while most of the countries with which we enjoy friendly relations don't have sudden avulsionary changes of leadership that suddenly turn from friendly to maybe hostile or unfriendly or, or, or difficult, the arrival of a leader like Duterte into power in, in uh, the Philippines is another cautionary note. If you build your intelligence cooperation uh, on a presumption of permanent friendship, but the political system of the country isn't stable enough or durable enough to support that, you may have built on a foundation of sand. Uh, even, for example, Malaysia and the return now of Prime Minister Mahathir, uh, who has always walked a very fine line between you know, the, the, the former communist world and the free world and the non-aligned movement, uh, Malaysia enjoyed for a time a government that was inclined to be conspicuously, well, I think rather warmer to us. And with Mahathir's return, I suspect his default is going to be back to an arm's length relationship with the US as he traditionally enjoyed in power for his many years. So again, it seems to me there are some limitations in the political geography of that rim of uh, East Asia that uh, you were referring to that, that puts some distinct limits on how far this Intel cooperation business can go. Hey, I was gonna be, I was say, I was a little worried where you're going with the ISI until, I thought you're gonna be giving it an endorsement until you got no, to I, no, like I said, who in their right mind, I mean. <laughs> yeah, I was a little worried there for a second. Okay, so another topic here. What role do international organizations play with regards to alliances? Specifically thinking about the, the ICC and other roles, other organizations like that. What role do international organizations, organizations play, play with, with regard to, to building or, or working on alliances? You're, you're muted again. Uh, Ambassador Hughes, you're, you're on mute again. <laughs> okay, it seems to me this one ought to be punted to Caitlin to start off because she talked about an international organization that kind of gave birth to an alliance. Uh, yeah, so um, I think that especially with, um, in terms of America's approach to international organizations, I get back to Dr. Marlowe's earlier comment about, you know, we think they're a good idea, in, in, in kind of hypothetical terms, but in terms of like dealing with what that means in practicalities, 
um, we we come at it a little haltingly, um, preserve, wanting to desire to uh, to preserve a lot of our sovereignty. And I'm thinking in particular with the International Criminal Court um, and the humanitarian uh, crimes against um, or the 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 Hague Court. Sorry. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, in terms of you know international organizations, especially um, the Organization of American States, the interesting thing about that history is the whole concept of arbitration um, and using it as a practical tool to avoid uh, armed conflict between states over political disagreements um, was based on um, Andrew Carnegie's experience with the Alabama claims case, which was heralded as the first successful um, arbitration case. Uh, We took a claim against the British government for them allowing the Confederates to build uh, naval warships in the uh, Liverpool port um, and destroying not only Union ships during the American Civil War, but also a lot of Union lives and then also economic material. Um, And Carnegie really was a big proponent of the idea of creating uh, some sort of framework Um, not only for arbitration, but the concept of international law and how you could enforce that even while maintaining sovereignty. And um, I think in terms of like getting back to the question that was asked, I think there's certainly um, some benefit to having these um, kind of, and this is why I'm so uh, kind of an admirer of the Organization of American States and that history is, is that going back to Ambassador Hughes' earlier remarks about flexibility in that there were no kind of, there was some general idea of what they wanted to accomplish, but they left it up to all of the participants who slowly walked to something where they could all agree to it, where there was meaningful, realistic expectations about what each participant could commit to. And that didn't happen overnight. It took time and effort and compromise and discussion. And sometimes it didn't go well, but eventually it grew into this organization that again, um, as issues crop up, you know, the the different partners were able to talk to one another and, and, and have discussion on these issues. So in terms of, you know, can those organizations lead to formal alliances, I I think it's possible. I just think that it needs to be taken in the context of America's tendency towards those agreements, especially with relationship to us guarding our sovereignty and ability to protect our interests um, and and American citizens, especially when it comes to the criminal court. Um, uh, I... Uh, to compliment Caitlin's observations, uh, I, I took the question a bit differently. I didn't think of the international organizations so much as leading to alliances, but rather thinking about how international organizations act on alliances or have effects on alliances and vice versa. I teach my students uh, to th- try to think about international relations as multidimensional chess. And it seems that the last question about intelligence cooperation in the Pacific Rim, and this question both involve a sort of an element of, of, if you would, multidimensional international chess. What do I mean? Uh, Well, in some international organizations, uh, working with your allies uh, can be a big help. For example, when we have international radio frequency spectrum allocation conferences, uh, uh, if we and our allies uh, share certain objectives about what frequency should be reserved for military use or confined to certain specific civilian uses and so forth, that may have important defense and intelligence collection implications. And if we are working with our allies closely and we both understand that those are equities on the table, even though we may not say so explicitly in the conference deliberations, we know what we're trying to protect or preserve or prevent from happening or prevent from becoming complicated. So that's the positive side. And you can think about that happening in um, uh, civil aviation, 
um, other areas of technical cooperation within the UN system. Uh, the, uh, the flip side can be where your allies become free riders uh, because there are more the individual allies may count on the alliance leader, the US may be the country that has the most at stake and therefore can't afford to give in on certain principles, for example, with respect to an international criminal court or certain ways of handling what uh, some people would uh, want to make accusations of human rights violations. And so knowing that the US is going to take the heat and lead the charge and try to stop uh, the snowball of some adverse uh, international action, they can become part of the log rollers on the other side, uh, siding for their own, uh, you know, political uh, burnishing purposes, siding with our uh, antagonists or our, um, you know, those who are annoying us. Um, and then in between, there is uh, the situation of, for example, the uh, World Trade Organization or any other uh, uh, compliance bodies associated with multilateral uh, trade agreements, where uh, kind of where you stand on the dispute in the organization will largely be determined by where you sit and where your economic interests are engaged, whether positively or negatively in a given issue or given dispute. So um, I guess I would say, <laughs> as it sounds a little bit like cop-out, cop it's complicated and it depends on both the organization and the issue and the relationship, not only between the allies who may be working together or the allies and other groups of countries with which particular allies, like uh, the French are sort of notorious for this sort of thing, uh, uh, burnishing their relations with former colonies in Africa, or especially with oil rich kingdoms in the Middle East, or even sometimes with uh, countries in Southeast Asia, uh, and leaving the heavy lifting and the hard work to somebody else. Uh, so, like I said, seems to me it depends. Frank, you're muted now. My phone was ringing, so I had to turn off the, the thing before everyone heard it. And I, I kept yeah. telling myself, I got to turn it back. Understand. Understand. Uh, I think that's about all the time we have. I, I, uh, it's 5.58 by my clock. Uh, and so I think uh, I think I would just like to, to thank everyone for joining us today. Um, I hope you found this interesting. I want to thank my panelists. Um, they, they brought the expertise, and I brought the face, I guess. Uh, so thank you all for attending and looking forward to, see, to having you attend another one in the near future. Thanks. Thanks, Thanks everyone.